Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thanks for joining us. In this video, we are going to talk about graphics technology. Evolution of graphics technology. This presentation is an introduction to graphics rendering on modern video cards. In order to understand the current technology, it is necessary to look at the history of the graphics industry and how the current standards evolved. This will help explain what the various hardware companies and software vendors are trying to do in the graphics world. It is uncommon for a software application to have absolutely no visible user interface. A background process or a daemon are good examples of when no graphics are required. A program which has only basic text may not benefit from high quality graphics. However, the majority of modern applications require sophisticated image rendering for even simple things like enhanced text shapes, emojis, and supporting high-resolution displays. The field of computer graphics originated in the late 60s with the first SIGGRAPH conference in 1969. SIGGRAPH, the special interest group in graphics, is still a driving force today in the computer graphics world. With the advent of affordable personal computers and video games in the late 80s, the topic of computer graphics migrated from academia to one of general interest to consumers and businesses. Around 1995, real-time 3D graphics became possible on consumer-grade hardware, and this started a change in how developers looked at improving their software for a better user experience. The power of 3D graphics lies in displaying and representing geometric objects which exist in a three-dimensional space rather than flat shapes just placed on a two-dimensional plane. How do you make something look like it has three dimensions when you're actually looking at a flat monitor? What does it take to add perspective and lighting to a scene? Can this be done in hardware only, or is it a combination of hardware and software? Reviewing the history of 3D graphics helps to explain which companies presented new technology, which players survived, and what forces continue to push the graphics industry. This story starts in 1989. SGI began work on a new 3D graphics library called GL, which provided access to their high-end 3D rendering hardware. This hardware was expensive and not widely used, but it was the only option for real-time 3D graphics which provided any degree of realism. In an effort to increase the number of potential users for the library, and therefore bring in more customers, they decided to collaborate with Microsoft to bring an open-source version of GL to the Windows platform. This project was successful, and in 1992, the OpenGL1 standard was released. While SGI had been the main designer, they decided to place the future direction of OpenGL in the hands of an industry group called the Architecture Review Board, or ARB. Both SGI and Microsoft were voting members of the ARB, as well as several other interested parties. In 1995, Microsoft released its own API called Direct3D, in direct competition with OpenGL, which was a bit odd and seemed like a conflict of interest. In 2000, an industry group made up primarily of hardware developers was formed. This was the launch of the Kronos Group. The purpose of this committee was to develop and maintain open standards for vector graphics. In the beginning, they had no association with the OpenGL project. A few years later, Microsoft abandoned its position on the OpenGL ARB committee and devoted all its 3D graphics efforts towards its own direct 3D standard. The following year, OpenGL 2.0 came out, which was a major overhaul of the API. This new version added support for a programmable rendering pipeline, which gave developers the ability to design their own rendering algorithms. This was a highly requested feature, but unfortunately, the code had to be in assembly and was very hard to develop. 
A few years later, Direct3D version 9 was dominating the market, and development on OpenGL appeared to be dying. Developers using OpenGL were frustrated with SGI. There was hope that after two years of inaction, the OpenGL API would finally be updated. But the company was having its own internal problems, and at the SIGGRAPH conference in 2006, they announced the Kronos Group would become the new maintainers of OpenGL. Two working drafts of OpenGL were announced and slated to be released in 2007, but nothing was delivered. The community was once again frustrated and felt like they were in the dark. OpenGL 3.0 was finally released in July of 2008, four years after OpenGL 2.0. Sadly, it fell short of expectations. What's amazing is that the Kronos group just kept working on it, and ultimately OpenGL 3 turned out to have some decent features. At this same time, AMD, who was a CPU developer, acquired ATI, who had been developing GPU graphics hardware. This resulted in the fusion of the CPU and GPU into one chip called the APU. This combined processor has become popular for mid-range systems. A valuable feature of OpenGL 3 was that it ran on Windows XP. As of OpenGL 3.2, the API had caught up with the Direct3D feature set. Developers who wanted access to new features like geometry shaders now had a choice about which API to use, rather than requiring their customers to upgrade to the unpopular Windows Vista just to use DirectX. This began a resurgence of interest in OpenGL and brought it back from being nearly obsolete. It is interesting to note how many times in this progression that hardware companies have worked directly with software vendors to ensure compatibility. In 2010, AMD and NVIDIA both had graphics cards coming out, and they wanted to guarantee their hardware played nicely with the upcoming version of DirectX. So both hardware vendors worked very closely with Microsoft. In 2011, a number of developers and vendors were disappointed with the existing interfaces for rendering graphics. One of the lead architects for AMD wrote a widely published article. He noted that while a graphics card on a PC had 10 times more processing power than the GPU in a game console, the graphics on the PC did not look significantly better. Part of the explanation for this disappointing fact was that OpenGL and Direct3D were single-threaded interfaces. The CPU and GPU had both been improved to have several cores. However, the communication between the two devices was restricted to a single CPU core. This severely hampered performance. On top of this, so many features and extensions had been added to OpenGL over the past two decades, hardware vendors were finding it very complicated to design adequate drivers. As a result, the drivers were often not capable of transferring commands to the GPU as fast as they could be processed. Vendors were determined to release new interfaces to resolve this threading issue. A few years later, two completely new projects emerged, Mantle from AMD and Metal from Apple. This was followed by a major update to DirectX with version 12. All of this happened in a 12-month span. These new interfaces were multi-threaded, offered lower-level abstractions more closely tied to the hardware, and promised improved performance. One of the key goals had been to reduce driver overhead and allow the GPU to reach its full performance. Mantle, Metal, and Direct3D did basically the same thing. However, none of them were cross-platform, and some only worked with specific hardware. Developers were faced with some difficult choices and were unsure how to support all three of these interfaces. In an odd twist, AMD decided to relinquish Mantle, and they handed it over to the Kronos Group. It took two years 
for the Kronos Group to release their new API, which they called Vulcan. It was based heavily on Mantle. A great deal of work had to be done to enhance the API and generalize the AMD-specific hardware limitations. Support for Vulkan was quick. For example, Android 7 supported Vulkan just six months after the initial release of the API. Within 12 months, four major game developers had placed their support behind Vulkan, and the entire industry was very enthusiastic about the future. The Kronos Group has grown considerably since then and currently has over 120 members, all of whom collaborate to improve the open standard for graphics. The adoption of Vulkan continued to accelerate in 2018. The Molten VK library was released to provide a compatibility layer to the Metal API. This allows a Vulkan application to run on Apple platforms with native performance and only minimal code changes. The Glove project is another translation library. This one converts an OpenGL ES application to run using the Vulkan API. Using the combination of Molten VK and Glove, most legacy OpenGL applications can be adapted to access the Metal API to run natively on Apple devices. These translation layers are important to developers since Apple officially deprecated OpenGL on all of their platforms in 2018. Metal is now their only supported rendering interface. It may seem like Apple is trying to force developers to use Metal and lock them into a proprietary OS. There's no question that OpenGL was losing ground and lacking in performance. It's worth remembering that Metal was released a full year before Vulkan. It makes sense that Apple wanted something better, but it has upset part of the graphics industry that they decided not to incorporate Vulkan on Apple platforms. Thankfully, the Molten VK library showed up as a bridge, as long as the Apple Store continues to accept the Vulkan Molten VK apps, everyone wins. In our next video, we will explore what or who is driving the graphics industry, the recent changes in graphics hardware, details about the current API vendors, and what it takes to render. For more information about the Copper Spice project, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to leave a comment on this video or send us email. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in a few weeks for our next video.